our premier corporate underwriter, one of our sponsors, is Sheridan Press. Uh, Sheridan Press prints our magazine. Uh, Bates Creative is a corporate partner. They do uh, the cover design for the magazine. Imagination uh, uh, sponsored uh, some things at the uh, annual meeting. And today's sponsors are Nailer Association Services and uh, picture this video. And uh, we, we have a couple of minutes for them to introduce themselves and, and their organizations to the group before we get started. Uh, first off is John Kilchenstein of, uh, of Nailer. John. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to sponsor today's video on a budget. My name is John Kilchenstein from Nailer Association Solutions, and this is Aaron Weisberg. And for those of you who don't know, um, at a high level, uh, Nailer provides a wide range of solutions for associations with really three key goals, to help build a more powerful association, to improve member engagement, as well as drive non-dues revenue. And our five solutions today are career, events, we have an AMS, we also have learning solutions and our communication solutions which, which uh, Aaron and I represent. And our association advisor brand, we do a benchmarking survey each year and Aaron has a few stats from, from what we've learned this year from over the 700 association executives who took the survey and responded about some of the video questions we had. Thanks John, thanks for having us. Um, my name is Aaron Weisberg, uh, lead sales and project manager for Association TV, which is our Nailers uh, video content production and uh, management system. Uh, so I work with all the associations on their video platforms and their, their, their projects. Uh, so uh, what John was alluding to earlier about the benchmarking survey that we did, 700 associations, about half of which have integrated video uh, currently into their communications, another quarter of which will be are planning on integrating in, a, in the near future video communications. However, some of the metrics in the survey uh, on the other end of how the members are interacting with the video content and how uh, the associations are finding their uh, return on investment from their uh, video platforms uh, are a little bit lower than we'd like to see and that's what our responsibility is to help the associations bring those numbers up. So thank you again for having us and uh, we're looking forward to the uh, presentations. Thank you. As Naylor uh, is providing the, the lunch that we're having today and providing the video which will be posted online uh, soon if you want to uh, review the session and for uh, people who uh, couldn't make it here today is uh, picture this video and Sharon Sobel uh, uh, would you come up and uh, chat for a minute about your organization? Hello everyone, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, my company's been in business since 1997 and we focus on corporate and educational video, whether it's events or um, training messages, training programs, similar to this. I do this a lot. and. Um, Actually, it was interesting to hear what Naylor does because they kind of fill in the puzzle piece that I'm always missing, and that is, I've made a great video for you. Now you need somewhere to put it and someone to track the marketing and, and the audience. So that's great that they're here too. Um, I know that there's gonna be a lot of great information from these guys, but one thing I just wanna say is anybody that comes with the idea of making video, <laughs> The whole idea of video on a budget is very interesting because if you don't have a budget, you probably should not even be considering video. <laughs> it's not that you need a huge budget, but you need something there. Basically anyone, whether it's yourself or, an, or you know, a company like mine, can work within a budget, but you've got to start with a number. It's, it's sort of like buying a house. I, I don't like it when people come and say, I want to make a video, how much is that going to cost? That's like going to a realtor and saying, I want to buy a house, how much is that going to cost? Think of it the same way. Figure out what your number is, and then that company or yourself, after this great session, will be able to tie that down to understand what that video is going to look like based on your budget. 
that's it. If you guys want to learn more about me, I've got business cards outside on the table. But thank you very much for having me. Let's thank our sponsors. <laughs> Starting the presentation today is Joe Valina, who's a publisher here at the uh, American Nurses Association and also the treasurer on the AMP uh, Board of Directors. So I'm going to shut up now and turn it over to Joe. All right, thank you guys for coming. Um, I hate speaking behind a podium because I'm short and it looks like I'm a talking head, literally. So um, we will go through here and um, look at lots of different things about video. So one of the takeaways that I want everybody to have from this session is that there are lots of different ways to approach it. Um, I would imagine that a lot of the people in this room, if not everybody in this room, has had conversations with uh, your directors or your board of directors about video because it's obviously becoming more and more prevalent and more and more important in how we communicate with our members and our other stakeholders. That, that um, request usually comes with a assumption that you'll be able to make the video for nothing or almost nothing. As our um, sponsor was saying, that's a very difficult road to hoe. But we want to try and give everybody here some concrete examples about the various different levels of funding and budgeting that you can do to uh, ensure that you can get something that you can use with your association within the strategy of how you want to communicate with your association, no matter what your budget is. So keep an open mind, be creative, and Remember, it doesn't have to be rocket science, but it does have to be clever. And so the, the first thing that I want to show you today is, um, I don't know, who, who was at the ASAE meeting um, last week in Detroit? Okay, a, good, a couple people. So the ASAE meeting was in Detroit last year, and next year it's going to be in Salt Lake City. And so I don't know who all knows a lot about Salt Lake City, but they have a little bit of an image problem with the fact that it's predominantly Mormon and people have a stereotype that there's no drinking or anything like that. So the um, Chamber of Commerce there worked with uh, some associations to develop a campaign around there's nothing to do in Salt Lake. And one of the things that they did is put together a, a really compelling, I think it's a compelling video that shows um, how there really is nothing to do in Salt Lake. So Lauren, if you can switch over for us. So what, what they've done there is something that anybody in this room could very easily duplicate. Um, 
if you'll notice, even though there's a lot going on in those videos, um, what they have put together are a collection, a montage of a lot of still images, some B-roll. B-roll is just footage of things that are happening, for example, at your events or at your meetings uh, with a compelling soundtrack and editing them together with a clever idea of playing on the stereotype and kind of turning it around. But what makes it look um, difficult, but it really is not, is all the different cuts and different um, ways that the images kind of move in and around each other. Um, the secret to that is that with video software editing um, suites today, th those types of transitions are really automated and very easy to do. You basically can drag in photos into the programs and all those things will automatically generate for you and you can lay a um, soundtrack on top of that and voila you have a good montage type video and this is something that pretty much anyone can do with a little bit of practice um, with the video uh, editing software that we can uh, look at here in a little bit. Well, I've got no... Sorry, we're trying to get everything put together here. So about short videos, this is um, a collection of statistics that I find really compelling. Um, a lot of the times we are asked to produce videos in associations that key off of the key association policy work and the people that are really involved in that policy work want to have everything that is incorporated in it in the video itself. And this can be a mistake because what ends up happening is you'll end up with a 25 or 30 minute video that nobody ever watches. So as you can see here, 60% of viewers click away after two minutes of your video. 45% click away after one minute. So you lose almost half of your viewers after one minute of video. And 20% click away after as little as 10 seconds, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. The good news is that each minute is worth 1.8 million words, according to Forrester Research. So what that means is that the video, while the attention span is much, much shorter than a traditional article, for example, the video is much more compelling and can deliver much more information in a very, much, in a very truncated amount of time. So given that attention gap, why do we even bother? And here are some other statistics that can bolster the reasons that we really need to incorporate video in one way or another in our association work. Sites with videos get visitors to stay up to two minutes longer. And two minutes doesn't sound like much until you look at your web stats with your web team in your association and realize that people click through your website at about a minute, you know, a minute for their entire visit on your website. Um, home pages with videos have conversion rates 20% better than without videos. This is, so that's a huge number. 100 million people watch online videos every day, so the market is gigantic. And again, granted, a lot of that is happy cat videos rolling around on people's floors, uh, which you probably don't have at your association unless you're the association of cat herders. Um, but the, the fact is that more and more people are watching video and becoming accustomed to watching video on the internet every day. And finally, 80% of internet users recall watching a video on a site visited in the past month. And again, this is a very important statistic because it gets down to the actual recall. You are trying to make sure that your association's message, whatever that message is, whether it's promoting a conference, whether it's promoting a policy, whether it's just promoting your association, you want that to stick with people. And 80% of the internet users recall the things that they've seen on video, which is a huge bump uh, up from traditional media. So before we move on, uh, I just wanted to kind of touch base on some of the software that you might come into contact with if you are learning how to do this on your own. And um, for the very beginning novice filmmaker, iMovie is your friend. So iMovie comes with uh, a lot of Macs automatically on there. And then you can also download it as an app from Apple. Um, it's super simple. You can basically import your, your video. It automatically cuts it into clips, drag and drop the clips. The um, transitions, everything are automatic. It, it basically puts the movie together for you. The key then is, um, as Brandon was saying, to have your story intact and ready to roll so that you're not just randomly putting things together and making a boring video out of it. But it's, uh, if nothing else, iMovie is great to kind of like cut your teeth on and learn how the video um, editing software actually works. Because once you get past the iMovie stage, you can go to Final Cut Pro, Adobe Premiere Pro. There are several different expert level ones that have lots and lots of different 
features that you can use and are much more advanced, probably would not advise any beginners to just jump into Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere. You'll be really lost. Um, but it is much more powerful. Just know that. And you should know what your uh, production folks are talking about. If you're outsourcing this, um, ask them what they're using and find out why, and it will give you an idea of how to, um, to uh, provide the parameters for your vendors. Finally, there, there are a couple new innovations that are coming out. And actually, you're all on the internet live right now. So I'm using Periscope to do this. And basically, I downloaded the Periscope app to my phone. I went to Periscope, put a name on this. It tweeted it out automatically for me. And you're all on the internet live right now um, to the entire world. So I hope you uh, signed the waiver on your way in. <laughs> Um, so Meerkat and Periscope are the, the two apps that are, are really um, kind of out there right now. This is probably not the best way to do it, what I'm doing right now. I just wanted to do it as an example of how easy it is to get online and do um, live streaming, which used to be a serious pain, but now is much easier thanks to these apps. Um, one really ingenious way to do it, uh, I think pretty, pretty cool, is at ASAE, a friend of mine was doing 15-minute Q&As with the ASNE um, attendees and then tagging them all the same so that once you go onto there and look up the tag you can see this whole um, series of Q&A's with people that took about 15 seconds each for him to do but together forms a, a nice little body of work that kind of gives a good idea of what the ASAE um, meeting was all about so I'll sign off for Periscope you're now offline you don't have to worry about your hair anymore and one, one of the things we should mention at this point is that don't just grab your favorite song off of iTunes and throw it onto your video. It's totally illegal, and BMI and ASCAP will sue you into oblivion, so <clears throat> do not do that. <laughs> yeah. Good point. People, people have a misconception that Internet means free, and that's, that's not the case. Somebody, somebody did the work to produce that. You know, they, they, they should get their due. And that's it for me, so I guess we all have the questions. Sure, we'll open it up for questions at this point. Um, yes, sir. So the question is about music, where to find um, low or no cost music. Yeah, believe it or not, there, there are some low cost and, and even um, essentially no cost options out there. Um, <clears throat> you, have to be, you have to be careful about them. Uh, if you do internet search for uh, royalty free music, you should find some sites. Uh, what I did just to make sure is sometimes these, these licensing agreements are a little bit confusing. If you have in-house in -house counsel um, or access to counsel on retainer, just to be sure, I would I would put whatever the license is for that music, have them take a look at it, and make sure that that you have the right to use it. I've used stuff that um, you know, has cost me very little or nothing. And one other place that I would say to go to um, again, you'll have to work out a deal with the uh, the artists themselves. But one of the biggest areas for non-signed uh, musicians on the internet is Bandcamp.com. So one thing that you can do is go to bandcamp.com and you can sort by genre. So let's say you need some ambient music you know, to, to go behind something. You can actually sort by ambient and uh, find something you like and actually get in touch with the artists themselves and work out some sort of a, um, a deal with them. A lot of artists will be happy to work with you on something like that. But again, they own the copyright to that, um, so you have you can't just pull it off there. You need to work with them to do it. But that's one of the ways that the internet has made uh, made it easier to source this type of thing because, like we were saying, you may have somebody on staff. I think both of us play guitar and probably do the music for our own videos. But if you don't know anybody personally, this is a way to find people that do make music. And a lot of the quality is super awesome. I mean, it's it's very high quality on there. So.
Yes. I would, I would oh. back to the one other thing to the music. Um, when, when I came on a more, they were paying a, a yearly fee for um, a production house, and it was kind of use all you want, but we were going to pay a few thousand dollars a year, and we switched from that to um, just buying music um, per use. Uh, the site we use is AudioJungle.net. And it's kind of one of these things, people make music, people upload it, and then you can search and decide whether you want it. And depending on the licenses, some, some pieces of music are five bucks. Uh, if you're going to use a, a more advanced license, it may be a little under a hundred bucks. And, and I will add that you, you should check with, if you're in a larger association, uh, you should check with your meetings department because a lot of the times your meetings department will already have a licensing agreement with ASCAP or BMI. So maybe you can use some of those bigger um, you know, songs that you've heard on the radio uh, as part of their agreement. Because when you, when you have a conference, for example, and they're playing music over the intercom, they have to have an agreement in order to be able to do that. So you may be able to work it into that agreement as well. But again, just be, be careful, be legal, and you should be good to go. Yes, sir. Actually. Hi, um, one suggestion uh, for that. YouTube actually has a free uh, audio library as well, just to check that out as well. A lot of artists put music on there and you can find instrumentals just to use for free. Just a suggestion. Just one other thing to think about. Um, I'm aware of at least one project where um, you have to be aware of how the licenses affect each other. So there was one project where there was voiceover, there was music, and there was stock, stock footage. And the voiceover license lasted for a certain amount of time. And once that time expired, then the voiceover rights were gone. Well, the music rights lasted as long as the video didn't change. So once the voiceover rights were gone, you had to change the video, which meant the music rights fell apart also. So, so just be aware that, that these things can be intertwined. Yeah, we will make the presentation available through AMMP's website. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Um, what kind of camera did you use in the MOA interview? Um, so I shoot with a, we, right before I came to MOA, they invested very heavily in Nikon, in a Nikon DSRL, um, to my disappointment once I came on. <laughs> uh, if I could go back and switch that to Canon, I would, because Canon is obviously the leader in uh, DSLR video, but uh, that was a Nikon D7000. Uh, we have two of those, which is the point Patrick and I talked about, the equipment list, having two, uh, just double that equipment list. Having two of everything on that equipment list is a good idea to shoot for, right? Uh, that was shot on a Nikon D7000 with, um, I think it was a kit lens, um, probably three lights, and uh, when you shoot on a DSLR, DSLRs are notoriously bad for audio. So you're capturing your audio completely separate on a separate device. On a, on a Marantz was the device I was used to capturing that. And it's just a, like, a, like a box you hook up. Um, there's this one right here, Patrick's, um, that you hook up to a microphone and then pin it on there. Bill. What kind of, was it just a basic <clears throat> It was a Sony lavalier mic, and um, it, it wasn't a cheap one. I think they run about uh, two or three hundred bucks. Um, but you know, the thing about video, if it's going to live online, um, it doesn't always make sense to have a five hundred dollar microphone sometimes to capture your interviews, right? Sometimes. Uh, I hate Radio Shack, but a, a ten dollar microphone from Radio Shack sometimes will do the job, right? And I think one of the issues there is you have to be aware of where the where the final product is going to go. Uh, Ninety percent of the time, if you're going online, that's great. But just if there's ten percent of the time that you're going to show it at a conference on a giant forty foot screen, then then just be aware that that's where you really want to make sure that that you are using the high end stuff. Um, and, and the DSLRs, I mean, they have some some real advantages in terms of light. They are very sensitive to light, and that's great. Uh, in, in general, <clears throat> they're not well suited to interviews. You can work around them, but they, they have a time limit. Most of them is about 20 minutes, uh, and then they'll shut themselves off, and they get too hot. So if you want to sit there and do an hour-long interview, they're not well suited to that. And then, as Brandon said, you're going to capture the audio separately. That means that you have to sync up the audio and the video later in the production. Now, it, it's not that hard to do once you know it, but if you're already a little bit uh, intimidated by, by editing, 
that's one of the first steps. You're never, it's never going to sound right unless you sync it up. And the easiest way to sync up a video is you have the person in front of the video, clap, make sure that they're in front of the lens, and then you've got uh, a visual that you tie to the audio. There's a spike on the audio track, and it's, it's not hard to do once you know how to do it. I sympathize with you turning those stories around. I, we were talking about, I used to work in TV news where you show up at 8 o'clock in the morning and they give you four stories you know nothing about and you come back at 5 o'clock and you have to be an expert on all four of those. So I don't miss it and I, I, uh, I sympathize with you. We have a small video studio um, at MOA that is a room that um, they, they were very generous when I first came on board and they said, tell us what you need to make this work. <clears throat> Luckily, it's a long room, so I can be at one end and shoot towards the other end and it makes the space seem a little longer, get a little, little better depth of field, that type of thing. We've set up a system where, with a rod in the back where you can change backdrops pretty easily and those can be you know, sheets or you can get, they have some really nice wrinkle-free backdrops that you can change very quickly. Um, I would say, um, Backdrop, camera placement, and your lighting. Um, all three of those, you could work with all three of those to make that work. Yeah, I had a, I had a studio also, and it, it can be a challenge. Um, uh, one of the most um, flexible things you can do uh, if you want a lot of options, um, you get green screen paint. If you've got a flat wall, you paint the wall with the green screen paint. In front of that, you put a backdrop, and that's you know, whatever color backdrop you want. And then they do sell at B&H, uh, it's like a shower curtain that you install on the ceiling and you have another backdrop. And that way you can pull one ba backdrop in front of the other really quickly. Um, I think like Brandon said, you can use the lights, you know, if you throw a plant in there, it, it, it doesn't take much because your field of view is typically pretty pretty narrow when you're shooting an interview. Um, and, and then the last thing is, um, if you have a gray backdrop, you can turn that into anything. Uh, do you know what a gel is? Yeah, so if you gel your lights, uh, gel for those who don't know, use a regular light that's white, and a gel is basically a, a colored piece of plastic that goes in front, and it makes that light whatever that color is. So a red gel makes the light red. Um, if, you, if you have a gray backdrop, a flat you know, backdrop, um, and you point a red light at it, it becomes red. Whatever color you point at it, it becomes. So that gives you some flexibility. Now, I will tell you, having done a whole lot of them, at some point it doesn't matter what color it is, it gets, it gets boring. Uh, BNH Photo Video is uh, a website. It's up in New York. Um, they are phenomenal. If you are, if you do decide to get the gear and produce content in house, uh, my suggestion for you is sign up for their deal of the day. Um, and every day they'll put something on sale. And sometimes it'll be something you don't care about at all. And sometimes it'll be exactly what you want. Uh, this audio recorder goes for about 180 bucks. I got it for 100. Um, so I've gotten a lot of uh, photography equipment and other equipment that way. You just kind of keep an eye on it and you'll get a good price. One of the things I would add to make this a B&H commercial, maybe we'll get free stuff, is uh, one of my favorite things about going to B&H online, uh, it's like a kid and I can't, I can't go to there and not want to buy something. Um, they have a great um, product review section on almost every product they have has been reviewed by um, not just people who bought it, but people who have been using it for years and they'll tell you uh, it lists pros and cons, what it's good for, what it's not so good for. It's incredibly valuable. I use that when looking at equipment to purchase uh, for uh, bnhphoto.com. Is that what it is, bhphoto.com? And, uh, of course, for the real super budget con uh, conscience, the, there's always Craigslist. I mean, photographers are serious about being early adopters for, uh, for the most part, and so you can find totally... Last year's completely state-of-the-art cameras and equipment on Craigslist for super giant discounts, and they work totally fine. So obviously, buyer beware, just like any Craigslist deal. I just watched a crazy movie about a horrible Craigslist experience last night. But, um, you know, go, go with a friend, and <laughs> you can find some good deals on there. Yeah. 
uh, along those lines, another site is Adorama, A-D-O-R-A-M-A, -A, and, and they've got some really good deals too. And, and both of those sites do sell used equipment, and those can be really good deals. And, and unlike Craigslist, you have a reputable organization that will list for you. They will rate how, what, equipment, what kind of shape this equipment's in. Um, so you can look at that and say, okay, this is an 8 out of a 10. This is worth my money. That's a 6 out of a 10. Or they'll tell you this doesn't work, but you can use it for parts. Um, so that, that's another option for the used equipment. I'm going to make one more plug for uh, uh, video editing software. We had talked about that. One other option, um, and it's an option I used at work, the newspaper I was working at before I came to MOA. It's a piece of software called Adobe Premiere Elements. And I got there, and they had that, and I thought, oh, geez, what? Because I, I think I was using Avid before that, and, and it's about $70 at Walmart, right? It's a, it's a very low-end, entry-level piece of uh, software. But there was nothing I wanted to do that I couldn't do um, with that software. We was doing simple edits for newspaper news stories, but uh, it was very versatile, and it is a great entry level uh, if you're going to stick with Adobe. The learning curve from that to Adobe Premiere Pro, which is much more advanced, um, it's a lot easier than moving maybe from iMovie or Final Cut to Premiere Pro. It's called Adobe Premiere Elements. I don't think it's on the, I think you have to purchase it. Um, it comes with a lower level Photoshop type of program too. Um, but I looked it up yesterday, it's on their website. You can download it, uh, $69. Are there any more questions? No, well thank you all for coming. Let's thank our speakers, Joel and Patrick and Brandon. And let's thank our sponsors who made this day possible. <laughs>